If there's a genre of video games I can't ever get enough of, outside of RPGs, it's point and click adventure games. Be it Monkey Island, Gabriel Knight, or even The Room, adventures always keep me entertained and the puzzles keep me sharp. With that in mind, a few years ago I dove headfirst into a franchise and became a fan overnight. That is Nancy Drew, developed and published by her interactive and based on the world famous novel series that's been going on for quite a few decades. The Nancy Drew games have been going on for 25 years with about 33 games released and a 34th coming soon. Not only that, but the character is celebrating her 93rd anniversary this year. So with both of those in mind, I figured it's the right time to talk about everything Nancy Drew. In case you've been wondering how to jump into the series, as always, I'll keep it short. The Nancy Drew series is developed by Her Interactive, originally a division of American laser games called Games for Her Interactive, created with the goal of releasing games that catered to young girls. The first games released by this division were Mackenzie & Company, an FMV dating sim, and The Vampire Diaries, also an FMV game but a point-and-click adventure. Following them was Secrets Can Kill, the first Nancy Drew game. With the success of the series, her interactive managed not only to become independent, but also eventually buy out its parent company. In addition, the Nancy Drew license, originally set for about 12 games, was extended indefinitely. Since the first game, Her Interactive released one to two new entries per year, using the same engine and updating it as time went by, improving the user interface and adding some quality of life adjustments, at least until game 32, Sea of Darkness. There is a four year gap between that title and the next one, Midnight in Salem, a rather turbulent period for the company, which saw a change in leadership and then the dismissal of most of its staff. Not to mention a drastic change in the way the company interacted with its audience. The phrase radio silence is very apt in this case. Midnight in Salem would release in 2019 to middling reviews and tepid reactions from the fandom at best. But a new game is on the horizon and early signs seem positive on all fronts, not just on what's been shown, but also in her interactive engagement with the fans, seemingly a return to form for the company, with far more open communication lines, even releasing puzzles on their social media and hiding ciphers in their newsletters that lead to early access to trailers and other promotional material, with fans and content creators banding together to solve all these mysteries and creating a significant buzz around the new entry. As of this recording though, there isn't a release date set for Mystery of the Seven Keys, or as most fans refer to it, Game 34. The Nancy Drew games are first-person point-and-click adventure games, where you click on the screen to interact with items and characters and move around the locales or scenes, which are pre-rendered stills from the character's perspective, which means that unlike third-person point-and-clickers, where the entire room is fully visible, in these, your movement includes turning around to face other parts of the room. This perspective is also kept on cutscenes, meaning that for the entirety of the series, you never see Nancy's face. Old games had a main menu, but from a point onward, they all started at Nancy's desk, where you see the details of the current case and can also take a look at the portfolio of past cases, each with a quick summary and some screenshots of those game's events. From there, you embark on the new adventure and decide if you will play as junior or senior detective, the Nancy Drew equivalent of easy and normal. Playing on the easier difficulty means fewer puzzles, lesser complexity on some of the remaining ones, and most importantly, the task list, a handy mechanic that both helps you keep track of progress and may help in figuring out what's next. The Nancy Drew game star the eponymous young detective, traveling across the globe to solve mysteries, She's a renowned sleuth, often hired to come take a look at a curious situation, but that's not the only way Nancy finds mysteries. No, sometimes the mysteries find her. In fact, she's something of a trouble magnet. At any given time, for any reason, even if the purpose of the trip is pleasure, not business, Nancy will attract every criminal conspiracy in a five mile radius to herself. If there is someone doing anything remotely shady, They'll kick things into gear the moment she walks, flies, or sails into town, and will at some point make an attempt on her life. From her hometown, to Europe, and all the way to Japan, Nancy will find a mystery to solve. Joining Nancy are her longtime friends, Beth and George, her boyfriend, Ned, and at times even fellow detectives, the Hardy Boys. More often than not, they're on the other side of the phone, 
a fun little contact to talk to or part of the mystery needed to collect some clues or even the game's built-in hint system, where Nancy will mention some of the ongoing situations and her friends will say, uh, why don't you talk to this person or try to talk to that person? Having said so, there are some titles where these characters become playable. As a point-and-click adventure game, there will be some talking, some snooping, some collecting, and a whole lot of puzzling, both the inventory kind and the logic variety. Sometimes you just have to find the right item to use in the right place. Others, you have to figure out how to guide a wolf through a mine. For most of its lifetime, the Nancy Drew series ran on the Nancy Drew engine, first created for the Vampire Diaries. Over time, her interactive updated and upgraded the engine, for higher resolutions and cleaning up the UI and adding a myriad of quality of life adjustments. The first version of the engine had the clunkiest interface, not to mention that it took up most of the visible screen. The first nine games used this version of the engine, so from Secrets Can Kill to Danger on Deception Island. The second version is seen from games 10 to 15, from The Secret of Shadow Ranch to The Creature of Kapu Cave. Starting from this version, the gameplay part of the UI takes up most of the screen. Conversations, though, hide the main UI and replace it with a big box for the dialogue text. The next version is seen from games 16 to 25, from The White Wolf of Icicle Creek, famously covered in Game Grumps, to Alibi and Ashes, and also the remaster of Secrets Can Kill. This version has a minimalist interface, with the gameplay taking up more space and the different UI elements being semi-transparent pop-ups. This UI is often referred to as the Exploration UI, as most of the games in this area had Nancy travel to other countries. The last version of the engine, before things changed at her interactive, was used from games 26 to 32, Tomb of the Lost Queen to Sea of Darkness. It's the most modern style, with the inventory along the bottom of the UI instead of being a separate part displayed at the click of a button. After Sea of Darkness, her interactive decided to use other engines for their games, such as Unity for Midnight in Salem and Unreal Engine for the upcoming Game 34. It's an adventure game series based on detective novels, so its two major components are in fact the reason to come back every time, the mystery and the puzzles. Every single one of these games has an engaging plot, a complex mystery with many moving parts. It's got all the hallmarks of great detective stories, shady characters, strange coincidences, attacks on the protagonists, red herrings, misdirections, big confrontations with the big bad where you reveal their guilt, sometimes even the villainous monologue and the shocking <gasps> it was you moment. It's a full classic detective experience in every way and you won't be able to stop until you've reached the end. Puzzles are phenomenal, from your run-of-the-mill inventory puzzles, which at times have multiple parts, to the real meat of the design, the logic puzzles, with clues strewn about the environment. Not only that, but the Nancy Drew game universe is filled with engineers that would make Tony Stark feel inadequate, capable of incredibly complex feats of technology, machines that do pretty much everything and are locked not with keys, but with ciphers and other puzzles. It's rather funny how often you come across impossibly complex Rube Goldberg machines. Hell, one of the games has an entire train full of the stuff, and another has an actual Rube Goldberg puzzle. There is a tremendous variety of puzzle styles, and they almost never repeat from one game to another, so you never reach a point where the puzzle design feels stale, and that's saying a lot for a series with nearly 25 years worth of adventures. Sometimes Nancy needs to manage her money or keep her cover, and in those situations there are minigames, which honestly are just a set of very cleverly disguised puzzles. From darts and bartending to mini golf and snowball fights, there's always a trick or a clue that leads you to success. Every mystery needs suspects, and Nancy's cases are filled with unique and often over-the-top personalities that make it a true joy to interact with. Part of it is the writing, another the visuals, a bit dated but giving everybody a charming uncanny valid quality, and yet another is the voice acting. Eccentricity is a clear common personality trait in this world, with Nancy perhaps the only sane one. Then again, maybe Nancy isn't that normal either. After all, who would travel across the globe to a new mystery on the same day they had already made plans with their boyfriend without letting them know? Nancy Drew, that's who. The voice acting is delightful, the performers readily and heartily chewing the hell out of the pre-rendered scenery. 
Starting with a supporting cast of friends, family and rivals to the culprits, their performance are unforgettable. And don't mistake me, I said unforgettable and delightful. I didn't say good. Some of the voice acting is awful. Some of the accents are outrageously bad. But it all crosses that line of so bad it's good. Another point are the actual locations. Even in the darkest of games with deeper shadows and more toned on palettes, scenes are still colorful and memorable. Each game has a distinct vibe that clearly comes through via the pre-rendered scenes. And even if the setting is similar, each game has its own visual identity. For example, Castle Molloy and Castle Finster are both in spooky games, but look and feel completely different. One last point is the music. The series has one of the strongest soundtracks in the entire genre, particularly its atmospheric tracks, perfectly complementing the visuals in setting the vibe. This is especially true of those games that are closer to the horror or thriller genres where the music conveys a lot of the intensity required to sell you on the spookiness. Best examples of this are Shadow at the Water's Edge, a game that actually scared the pants off me, and Ghost of Thornton Hall, a game where the entire audiovisual package is geared towards horror. Not only that, but the main theme, originally the main menu tracking of their entries, is instantly memorable and found interpolated into other tracks across the series, in particular those related to Nancy herself and her family. With all this said, I am not going to claim that these are perfect games, but I can tell you that the whole package is outstanding, especially for a series with one or two new titles per year. The fact that these games have such a high quality is nothing short of amazing. The beauty of the Nancy Drew series, given how long it's been going on, is that you can pick up any game as an entry point. Even if you meet a character introduced in a prior game, the past history, more often than not, has little to no bearing on the mystery at hand, and any backstory is freely given so you're never lost. If you play them in order, the only takeaway is seeing the evolution of the engine for yourself. For this video, I tested the compatibility of all games on Windows 11, and though every PC is different, I had no issues running any of the available titles, so you're free to choose any of them as your starting point. Though, if you'd like my recommendation, I would pick game 16 and onwards as your potential start, the so-called exploration era, as it has what I believe are some of the strongest titles. With the next entry to the series coming soon, hopefully this year to coincide with the anniversary, but more likely next year, there's never been a better time to start playing this amazing series and joining Nancy on her adventures. I hope you'll give it a shot. There's a good chance that, like me, you'll fall in love with the series and its world, where everyone can be a master engineer and build incredibly complex traps and puzzles. If you liked this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing. Thank you for watching and happy trails.